like the fool I am, because I don't have enough on my plate, I've decided I'm going to try and read all of the Crescent City series in a few days. I already have so much on my plate, I cannot genuinely really fit this in, but I kind of want to. I mean, I'm not that excited to read the whole Crescent City series by Sarah J Maas. I mean, I read the first one over four years ago now, and I did really enjoy it. I think I gave it four or five stars. Never read the second one when it came out. I just wasn't interested by that point, and I haven't heard the best of things. But then book three has just come out, House of Flame of Shadow, and obviously FOMO. You see it making the rounds on Twitter, and Booktube, and Booktalk, and Bookstagram, and it's just everywhere. And it makes you feel a little bit left out. And I was waiting for my Waterstones pre-order email for this for, like, days. I thought, oh, surely they would have posted it by now, only to realise that I never actually pre-ordered it. So I did manage to pick this up this morning. I did check my library to see if they had it, but they don't. But I'm not really that excited to read them. I mean, I do want to read them, don't get me wrong. I really, really do. But I'm not moist. I'm not moist. I mean, there might be a little bit of dribble, but the kitty cat isn't swimming, if you know what I mean. And who knows, maybe when I reread House of Earth and Blood, the first book in the series, maybe it will remind me why I gave this a four or a five star in the first place, and then make me more excited to read book two and three. And I can barely remember what this series is about, to be honest. You might already know yourself, so you don't need me to re-explain it. I do remember there was Bryce. There was someone called Bryce. Mm -hmm. And she falls in love with a fallen angel called Hunt. That's literally all I remember. <laughs> wild, wild plot. By the way guys, this vlog will be filled with spoilers, so if you don't want to be spoiled for it, if you have interest in reading these books, maybe tune out now, but leave a like before you leave, and subscribe if you haven't already. <laughs> uh, this lighting's kind of cosy. <laughs> I ended up going to a cafe today so that I could just read in peace because my boys, Ash and Tobu, they do not like it when I enjoy myself. So I ended up reading the first 260 pages of this in like the three, four hours I was at this cafe and oh my gosh, the amount of things I'd forgotten since like reading this for the first time four years ago. I cannot remember how this book ends. I can't remember who killed Danica, for instance. I can't remember. I remember there's a plot twist. I remember there's a plot twist. I think there might be some kind of scene with some of those, you know, big canister things or whatever you call them, or like the big containers. And like, for some reason I remember there was a big plot twist and I can't remember what that bloody plot twist was. So it's a good job I'm rereading this because genuinely, genuinely cannot remember. And speaking of one of the shits who won't let me enjoy myself, here's Ash. Hi Ash. Can you let me just do an update in peace? For God's sake. So I remember that Danica died because I remember that being the moment in my first reading experience where I was like, oh my God, like this is, this is insane. And also this is just like so dramatic. So the part that I just read was at the end of chapter 25, Bryce took all of one step toward the booth before the club exploded. It's the club that Juniper, who is Bryce's friend, works in. But like, I forgot that that exploded. But honestly, ever since starting this in the cafe, I've been that much more excited about reading the series again. Like, I totally lost interest two years ago when House of Sky and Breath came out. Like, I just, I didn't want to pick it up. Even though I knew I really enjoyed this, I did want to pick it up. But restarting the series, I'm getting obsessed again. <laughs> and I remember having this obsessed feeling with the first book when I first read it too. I have a whole vlog dedicated to reading Crescent City for the first time, which I will not rewatch. That was back when I lived with my mum and my camera quality was terrible. That was a bygone era of my channel. I never want to look at that again. But I'm really enjoying myself. In knowing that Danica dies is adding a different level to this reread because I'm reading the first like 60 pages with tension, with anticipation, knowing what's going to happen around the corner. And I mean, if you do read the synopsis of this book, it does spoil Danica's death. But you kind of feel some level of attachment to her at the start. She feels like she's going to be a really important character who's going to be really strong and she's going to, I don't know, like have this huge impact in the story. And she kind of does, honestly, because after that whole thing happens, it does become a sort of mystery of who killed her and Bryce ends up having to be the one who has to investigate that. And again, like, I'm not really explaining the plot very well or cohesively or anything because you guys know exactly what happens. You guys will have already read this. So you do not need me to recap 
this book for you. There are plenty of amazing recaps on YouTube that will do that. But I really wanted to just re-experience it and like get excited for it again. But honestly, I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> it's just the fact that I forgot so much. Like Luna's horn getting stolen. And I'm like, is that gonna be important later? And yeah, it kind of is, because it seems to tie into Danica's death and like what happened there. And also the fact that the deaths are happening again two years later. So there was this whole like time jump thing, which is definitely needed too, because I feel like the connection between Bryce and Danica would have just torn Bryce apart and she would have been inconsolable for so long. And I like the fact that we skipped all of that grieving and we are getting moments of Bryce where she is overwhelmed with like either anger or sadness, but it's like really subtle moments in a way. I mean, she does smash an entire glass, which isn't that subtle, but like, you know, like the expiration of grief and losing someone who was so important to her, especially since Danica had said, I love you to her. And it was like a really sweet thing. It just, yeah, it, it does hurt. It hurts more on a reread. Totally forgot that Bryce is actually the half sister of Run? Rune. Rune. I think his name's Rune. He was like the crown prince of some type of fae. Literally, I'm telling you, world building is not my strong suit. Or at least like remembering all of the different names and titles for people. I'm never ever gonna learn all of that. He's a prince. So that's all I'm going with. He's a prince. He is Bryce's half brother, but everyone thinks that they're distant cousins because yeah, it's kind of a a mark on the whole bloodline lineage thing. I don't know. I'm just too invested in the actual plot that's going on. And I'm honestly trying so hard to remember what that plot twist was. I remember it kind of blew my mind, but now I can't remember what it was. And I'm like, oh, damn it. I can't even remember what happens after this explosion that happens at the club. I can't remember who summoned that demon thing that killed Danica and her pack. Oh my God. I forgot about Connor as well, and I'm not gonna lie, Connor made me vom a little bit. Like, you know, the person who was kind of sweet-talking Bryce? At the very start, like, it seemed like he would be the love interest, but then he gets torn to pieces. The text messages that he was sending Bryce, I mean, yes, they were very nice and lovely, but that kind of makes me a little bit sick. Like, I don't really love mushy romance. It makes me cringe, and the text messages that Connor was sending Bryce, made me cringe. The fact that he even had to beg for a date in the first place, I'm like, that kind of desperation really turns me off. Pizza, Saturday night at six, if you're late, it's over. That's what Bryce says to Connor. And then Connor replies instantly, I'll never keep you waiting. And that's not even the worst text or anything. It's when he texts her as she's on a date, I'm crazy about you. I don't want anyone else. I haven't for a long while. One date, if it doesn't work, then we'll deal with it but just give me a chance, please. Like, no, <laughs> no. Also, I'm thinking that there is gonna be some kind of war at some point. It's saying like the Pangir Pangiran, yeah, the Pangiran conflict. The angels think the war might spread here. There is so much setup that I would have totally forgotten about if I just went straight into book two without rereading the first book. So yeah, I'm, I'm liking those things. Also, The House of Fame and Shadow has been mentioned a few times too, which makes me so much more excited to read the third book actually, because The House of Fame and Shadow sounds the most intriguing to me. Yeah, apparently it's the darkest of the houses. And we meet some, this is like literally on page five. There's someone called Jessica. Jessica had joined The House of Flame and Shadow and now answered only to the Underking himself. Flame and Shadow suited her well. She possessed an arsenal of spells to rival any sorcerer or necromancer in the darkest of the houses. And I'm just like, that just sounds really cool. I really want to get to this House of Flame and Shadow now. You know, Bryce is fine as a main character. You know, she holds her own and she has a great, strong personality. I like her. I like her dynamic with Hunt. I like the fact that Hunt's been forced to like babysit her. And she is just so smart. Like Bryce is so smart. The way that she makes it seem like she doesn't care about the case or anything and she's just going to get her nails done, but she's actually getting intel and she's like finding things out about like the case and like the murders and people connected to the murders. And even I was bamboozled for a second because again, I totally forgotten pretty much everything. But it's just hilarious to see Hump being like, you don't care about this case at all, like take it seriously. And Bryce is like, look, I found this, 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 and this in the past like five minutes. What are you done? 
what have you done apart from watch me? It's like she can hold her own and she is a very smart and driven heroine. So I do really like her. Um, Hunt as well. At the minute, he doesn't blow me away just yet. I know he will get there because I did end up really falling for Hunt by the end of this book. He is caught in a very tough place and he is someone who has been through a lot and he is now answering to the governor and he has to do like 10 more missions now for Mika, Micah, before he can be free of his service. There was also, and I don't know if maybe she is involved with this plot twist, but Sandriel, I seem to remember she was like the villain of it. She pretty much tortured Hunt years before. And apparently she was gonna be the one to break him. And even just the mention of her coming to Lunathian or like Crescent City for like a week makes Hunt just shrivel up. You know, like he hates the idea of her being anywhere near him. And I seem to remember there was some residual trauma from those experiences from my first read. So I'm actually looking forward to falling for Hunt again because it's been too long. It's been too long. So me and Hunt, we need to catch up, maybe more. Well, no, I want to be surprised by this plot twist all over again. I'm literally racking my brain trying to think of what it is and I just cannot and it's driving me insane. Like, I need to know, but I have two live shows literally right after this. So I don't know if I'll be able to get much more read today, but oh, we're off to a banging start if you ask me. And I have highlighted quite a bit, not that you'll be able to really see, but like, I, I'm just really liking it. What did I write here? These guys, oh, actually, yeah, true. Um, so, <laughs> me agreeing with my annotative self. Rune and Hunt, they don't really like each other, but it seems very childish and also like really immature. Like they act like teenagers and I'm like, okay, Hunt is like 200 years old, right? And Rune is a prince. But why is it that she makes them act like teenagers when they're around each other? When Rune mentions about launching himself at Athalor, haven't had enough of his snipe remarks at the fancy ass spring equinox party, make it through every March. We're not really getting any substantial reason for why Rune and Hunt don't like one another, other than it's just manly urges. What is like genuinely the reason? Is it just because they're guys? Like, it, it feels very immature and like very teen. And just like some of the remarks that Hunt says, it just feels like something a 16 year old would say, not a 200 year old fallen angel. Sometimes I do feel like the dialogue can be a little bit cringe, but that's probably like one of my only criticisms. It's just highly entertaining right now and looking forward to diving back in. The of 505 pages in, and surely I'm not the only person who rereads something, doesn't matter how long after, it almost feels like you're reading it for the first time because you're shocked at how much you've forgotten. Danica is the one who stole the horn. Okay. <laughs> totally forgot about that. The creature thing that they've been thinking had killed Danica all this time turned out not to have been the thing that killed Danica. I'm like, okay, again. Right, okay, fair. I'm like, did I even read it the first time I ever read this book? I mean, I did. I definitely did. Maybe it's just a product of me getting older, but I've shocked myself. This is the copy of the book that I read all those years ago, and this is the proof copy. So I don't know if maybe things changed from this to the final product, but I'm telling you, so much of it, I'm like, and this was a four and a half to five star. I'm like, okay, what made it that? And this is honestly just a moment for me to show off my Crescent City collection. But I also have the tour editions of the first two books. I don't know if there's gonna be a tour edition of House and Flame and Shadow. You're gonna have to let me know if there is. But I do have the tour editions of these. Through Love All Is Possible, which is very relevant to the tattoo that Bryce has on her back in something that Danica used to say. And then Light It Up, which is also another thing that Danica would say to, to Bryce. I'm wondering if maybe something is going to happen there. And I haven't read this one yet, so I don't know how relevant that is to House of Sky and Breath. So. And then I do also have the beautiful Fairy Loot editions as well. Honestly, like... <sighs> You would think I was a bigger fan of the series. And I thought I would actually read these versions of them for this video, but then I realized I don't want to annotate these. 
I don't want to highlight in them. I don't want to ruin them. Like, they're too beautiful to do that with. So I also need a House of Flame and Shadow Fairy Loot Edition 2. Honestly, not much more to say about this part. I'm in part three, and I feel like this part is probably a, a section that kind of lulls, which is honestly fine. I feel like we've had quite enough of the action and like some revelations and world building that it's kind of nice to have a bit of a breather. I was actually looking at some reviews on Goodreads and there's been a few people saying, oh, this book doesn't get good until like 500, 600 pages. Or like people saying, oh, I don't want to read something that only gets good in the last half or last few pages. But I think this is kind of good from like the 60th page. You know, I, I don't think it takes that long to get into it. I feel like there's quite a lot that happens in the first 300, 400 pages and then now I'm in that kind of lulled moment. Hunt and Bryce are getting closer which you do need some quiet moments for that to happen and the part I just read it had Hunt in the shower naked and Bryce comes in and she is like cleaning him down and Hunt is obviously going through so much and he has so much mental anguish right now that it's kind of endearing to see Bryce do that. I will say though that Bryce and Hunt are like getting really close pretty quickly but I can understand why it's kind of like a buddy cop kind of romance at the minute too. The way that they're going place to place to interview people, to ask questions, like especially like Danica's mum as well, to see if she had anything to do with it all. But yeah, I can understand why they are getting closer. It just feels like a little quick, like the way that they genuinely are concerned and care for one another, that happens really quickly. But I guess it is a product of the close proximity. They were pretty much forced to work together and now they have like no choice really. And through that, they kind of have solace with each other, which is sweet, it is sweet, but I'm not somebody who absolutely loves sweetness. <laughs> and if I remember correctly as well, there isn't really any sex scenes in this. I remember being a little bit blue bold from this book when I first read it. Why is it random things I remember, but not actual genuine plot points? <laughs> but I do remember, I think there was a moment when they're on a sofa or something and we're getting close to things happening. But then I think they get interrupted and like nothing happens and I don't think we actually get an actual sex scene in this. So when I get to that part, I will let you know and see if I was right. But yeah, I mean, so far though, still so good. I'm really enjoying it. Well, I've only gone and finished my reread. And you know what? It's really fun. It's a really fun, entertaining book. Not a five star like I originally thought. I think I'm going to lower it to a four, which is still awesome. I just forgot like how Bryce ends up becoming literally the most important the most special, the most powerful person by the end of this book. Like, she's the horn? Why did I forget that? That's huge. Like, that's a huge, huge thing. And I forgot that she is actually the horn. Danica had, like, crumbled it up and got it tattooed onto Bryce. Through love, all is possible, which is, like, the most cliche thing I've heard in the whole freaking world. But that was a big revelation, and I knew there was a plot twist coming. But, like, there were so many different plot twists that I was like... Oh god, <laughs> like when I left you there was still so much to learn. So one of the plot twists that I kind of vaguely remember was when they're at the dock and it turns out that Hunt knew about Danica and like the uh, substance that she had used beforehand, like the synth. And I think that was the twist that I kind of remembered because yeah, there was some kind of dock thing. But that's not even like really a big twist or anything. It creates the most mundane conflict ever because then Bryce wouldn't trust Hunt and kind of like left him. Hunt moved from being under Micah and you know, being Micah's kind of slave to being Sandriel's. But it created like the briefest of conflicts between Bryce and Hunt because he'd kept it from her. The way that she ends up like trying to give her life for him right after that when she finds out that Hunt is now Sandriel's pet. The way that Bryce wants to give up the rest of her life and give all of these gold coins to Sandriel when she like finds out about the whole Hunt thing. I'm like, you literally hated his guts like five seconds ago because he kept so much from you. And now she's willing to throw everything away. I, it just, it was like such a brief moment in time where we had that misunderstanding, miscommunication kind of conflict, and then it's resolved straight away. That was just a bit too quick for my liking. But I think the thing that floored me the most was the fact that Danica was the one who killed her entire pack and then herself. And you know, like how, oh my God, like, trying to visualize what she did, or like any person, any human who has this synth thing is absolutely disgusting. It makes me feel physically sick 
what they do. And I'd totally forgotten that it was Danica who'd had that, but it was also Micah who had like arranged the whole thing. He was the cause behind Danica's death. And I was like, I've forgotten everything, everything. All of these, you know, really exciting plot twists and revelations, nothing. Absolutely nothing, no recollections. To actually then get the reveals and things, it it was so much fun. It really was. Like as much as I don't love a whole lot of things that happened with like Bryce in terms of like how important and chosen one she feels. Like she feels very fairer from Akatar. Like I'm finding it very hard to differentiate between the two of them. And even Selena, I think her name was, in Throne of Glass. I've only read the first and last Throne of Glass books. Like I don't really know that series very well. But like even just the little bit of Throne of Glass that I got, I feel through Bryce. She started off as someone who I felt stood out a little bit more, but as the book went on, she kind of blended in more with the other protagonists that Sarah J Maas has written. You know who I actually really like? I like Fury. Like, we didn't get too much of her, but I like her, and I like the fact that she and Juniper, I think, are lovers? Yeah! I even put, like, a little heart next to it as well. <laughs> Juniper and I have something that is none of your fucking business. I could no sooner stop talking to her than I could rip out my own fucking heart, okay? I really do like Fury, I do. I hope we get more of her in the next two books. And again, like, I have no clue going forward what happens next, because it'll be the first time I've read them. Is someone setting off fireworks? It's February 2nd, why? Literally, that sounds like it's coming right outside the house. Yeah, I remember, you actually get blue balled like twice in this book, but I'm kind of glad because, oh my god. Because when they realised that it wasn't the demon thing that came out through the portal that killed Danica and the pack, the moment they realised, the moment they realised that it's humans infected with synth is when they see on a flash drive the kind of tearing apart of limbs and the fact that they're left as like pulp. I'm just gonna talk through the fireworks because that's just fucking ridiculous. But yeah, they say all of this graphic, horrible, nasty stuff with all of the body parts and stuff. And then now finally Bryce knows what exactly killed Danica. Although she doesn't know it was Danica herself at this point, just the kind of cause of death. It's right during all of this when they start their first almost sex session. Tell me what you want, Quinlan, all of it. There was no doubt in her, none. Maybe they're celebrating the fact that I finished my reread of House of Earth and Blood. I wish I knew where I was coming from though. Ooh, they're pretty. Oh, that, ooh. Oh, that's so pretty. Wow. But yeah, they start ravaging each other right after all of this revelation, after seeing all of this dead body stuff. And I'm just like, time and place. She slid her hand down his front to his pants, the hard considerable length straightened against them. <laughs> you know, like, with Sarah J Maas, a lot of the sex scenes can be very hit or miss. I do love Akamath when I first read it. Haven't reread it, so who knows. But I'm kind of glad I got blowballed at this moment because I'm just like, this is not the right time for this. Come on. And then, yeah, towards the end as well, we have another almost sex scene and then Bryce's mother interrupts. And at this point I was like, you know what? Good on you. I feel like we will most likely get some epic sex scene in the second book. If we're going off the trajectory of like Akatar Akamath, it's the second Akamath book that has the steam. So maybe we're following the same formula with the Crescent City series. Yeah, I liked Sandriel's death. I liked Mika's death. All good. All good, it was exciting, it was. Had loads and loads of surprises, even as a rereader. So now I get to read House of Sky and Breath for the first time, and I have a confession to make. I have already read the last line of this book. Not the last line of the epilogue, sorry. The last line on page 798. I have already read that last line. And the reason I read that was because when I worked at Waterstones, and this book came out, my manager said, read the last line of the book. And I was like, okay. I didn't want to get fired. I mean, I'm kidding. She wouldn't fire me. But at that point, I was like, you know what? I'm not that bothered about reading it just yet. What could possibly go wrong just reading the last line of the book? So I read the last line of the book, uh, and I don't know how I feel still to this day. 
and I think it was two years ago when this came out. It kind of made me not want to read it, to be honest. It kind of put me off reading it even more so than I already was because I just didn't fancy reading it at that time. Two years later and I still haven't read it. Now I do, I really want to read it now. Rereading House of Earth and Blood has really made me excited to read it despite the lukewarm reception that this one's received. And I don't care about this whole multiverse thing connecting to Throne of Glass and Akatar. I don't care. I would rather it didn't do that, but you know, I guess that's what we're gonna have. But we'll see how I feel after I've read this book. I'm currently making a cup of tea. I am 102 pages into House of Sky and Breath. And like, let me get this straight. So. We had a prologue that was a little bit too long with someone called Sophie getting dropped to the bottom of the ocean. And she is a thunderbird. She's a thunderbird. She's a thunderbird. Okay. Just keeping that in. Because I think it might be important at some point. She has been mentioned. I think the River Queen is looking for her, which is... Could be interesting. Uh, also, Sophie's brother is missing. And that's who Sophie's trying to find. And if the River Queen finds... But, but you know what? I just started this book. Literally the first word was Sophie. I'm like, who the fuck is Sophie? So we do get back to Bryce and Hunt and everyone. And it just feels so like normal, which I guess is fine because I imagine shit is going to hit the fan soon. But the only thing that's really happened so far is someone called Cormac is laying claim to Bryce. And Bryce needs to be his bride. And obviously Bryce is an unmarried fae or half fae. She's still unmarried. And so she is like the property of the males in her bloodline, which is sick. Uh, this, the thing I don't like about Faze, I love the mythology behind Faze. And every now and then I do get sucked into Faye lore. But that part of it is a little bit fucked up. So I'm hoping Bryce can get out of that deal. Oh, also Ethan, Connor's brother. I'm wondering, is there going to be some kind of love triangle with Hunt, Ethan and Bryce? I doubt it. I doubt it, but for some reason I was just getting some vibes. I was like, okay, maybe I'm reading too much into that. Especially since the main conflict, I guess, of the first few chapters is whether or not Bryce thinks her and Hunt are a couple. Bryce didn't know what the hell she was to Hunt. Girlfriend seemed ridiculous when talking about Hunt fucking Athelor. And I'm like, why? Why does it seem ridiculous? He wears a baseball cap backwards. He calls you sweetheart every two minutes. Is she trying to convince us that he is some kind of brooding masculine figure who doesn't have emotions? Because that's the opposite of what Hun's been up to this point. He is nothing but emotion. He's been through emotions. He's going through the motions, you know, as Buffy would say. So like, why would it be ridiculous that she would be his girlfriend? Because it's Hunt fucking Athelor. Do you even know Hunt? Also, Rune, I was hoping he would be gay. I'm not gonna lie. He does have a bit of a sex scene with a female. However, Fury is currently scratching my LGBTQ plus itch. There might be some asses to kick if someone makes a move on my girlfriend. Juniper glowed at the term girlfriend. You know what? I love Juniper and Fury more than I love Bryce and Hunt, which might be weird. Like, don't get me wrong, Hunt is sexy. All I can think about while making this tea is how much I want to be teabagged by Hunt. But when it comes to ships, Fury and Juniper take it for me, not Bryson Hunt. So not a whole lot is going on right now, but I hope you like my frozen mug. <laughs> it's a heat changing one. Ash, stop being so cute. Probably can't say anything. It's currently nearly 3 a.m. I am 270, 77, 277 pages in to House of Sky and Breath. I finished part one. Nothing happened for so long. And then something happened like out of nowhere. You know, like how the Reapers kidnap Rune and Bryce goes in and then the Reapers tell Bryce that the Prince of the Pit wants to fight Bryce one-on-one. -on -one. It was like, all of that was happening like out of nowhere. I was like, okay, all we've had so far really, am I zoomed in too much? There's just been like a lot of talking, a lot of stuff to do with Sophie and how Danica is connected to Sophie. And apparently like they were exchanging emails and all these things. And you know how convenient it was when Ethan was standing on top of the coffee table and Bryce walks in and he 
falls through the coffee table and then that's how they find a secret compartment with all of these documents and newspaper clippings that Danica oh my god look at him oh my god look at him he was stretching ash 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 oh you was so cute oh look at you you're so cute look ash ash Oh, look, you're flopping around. You're so cute. You're so cute. Oh, I love you. Back to life, back to reality. Oh, and here comes my other baby. Hi, Topu. Is it time for bed? Is it time for bed, Topu? Yes. Yeah, speaking of my cats and their shit timing, when it got to the part where Bryce gave Hunt a blowjob, uh, it was like the most sexy stuff that was happening in a while. And that was when Ash decided that he wanted to, you know, lie on me and demand my attention. The scene with Bryce and Hunt was a bit hot. But, like, also before that, every single time she puts her fingers in his hair, he, like, purrs. He purred. It says, well, it says he nearly purred. And I remember in the first book, he also purred or wanted to purr. I'm like, look, is he a fucking cat or is he an angel? Can we just pick one or the other. I feel like I'm not caring a whole lot about what's happening with the whole like Dusk's Truth and Project Thur and all of this because I'm just like not attached to the fact that we have Sophie who I don't really know. I mean yes I'm a bit intrigued about where she actually is and if her brother is okay and all of that stuff. Yes and it was kind of exciting when it turned out that uh, Cormac is uh, Sophie's boyfriend, like, that was fine and well, but, like, when I'm thinking about the twists and turns of the first book, I'm just, it, this one doesn't have any kind of weight compared to it. Like, I'm just not really caring too much. And things are being explained over and over again. Things are explained to us about what's going on with, like, Sophie, for instance, and then we get the same conversation between other characters as they're explaining it to them as well. So we keep getting the same in full, like multiple times. It's just a lot of talking, a lot of asking questions. Like, what do you know? What do you know? What do you know? I know this. I mean, I'm still liking it. I'm just a little bit bored. This whole Prince of the Pit stuff though, Apollyon, that could be very interesting and exciting. But yeah, I need things to pick up now. So maybe things will pick up in part two. As I said, it is nearly 3 a.m. So I do need to go to bed. And I can't read this tomorrow either because I've got some friends staying. So I have to wait another day for me to read it, which I'm kind of good at about, honestly. But it'll be nice to have a day off from reading because <laughs> all I feel like I've been doing is just like reading, reading, reading. Considering I only started House of Earth and Blood yesterday and I'm already like halfway through, well, not halfway, but like partway through House of Sky and Breath. It's like, well, damn, girl, you're getting through it pretty quickly. But yeah, I'm a bit of a fast reader. But look, look at me, babies. Oh, we're going to bed now. Oh, we're going to bed. <laughs> I am not a hater, okay? I'm a truther. I have finished House of Sky and Breath, and I was going to come in and give you an update after I finished the second part of this book. But then I was like, what do I even talk about? Like, what would I be updating you on? Absolutely fuck all. <laughs> Because, yeah, I mean, obviously things happen in the book, but, like, when I think about the actual plot of this book, I don't know, I was just really, really bored. And it just felt so messy and sloppy and a bit all over the place. And it didn't feel very cohesive. And there wasn't really that much fun to be had here, unfortunately. And you know what? Now that I've read the ending in context, instead of just, like, reading that one line out of nowhere, I mean... It's interesting, don't get me wrong, it's interesting. I, I'm looking forward to seeing where we go from here. But if, like, say A Court of Silver Flames, right? I really enjoy that book. But I don't like Feyre in recent in that book because it's weird when you go, like, from being the main characters of a trilogy to just being, you know, side characters. And I don't know how Sarah Janet did it. But, like, she made them unlikable. And I really could not stand recent by the end of A Court of Silver Flames. And now I just think it's going to be even worse seeing those characters in a totally different series. Because now, like, Bryce has sort of opened a portal and she's gone to the world of Akatol. Which is something that the Asteri were kind of using Bryce for. Like, they wanted to use her because, you know, she is the chosen one. So, like, that's neither here nor there. I just... 
all of that pretty much happened in like the last hundred pages though. Like the stuff with Rigel is and all the revelations with Bryce and opening this rift. And up until that point, I just didn't really care a whole lot. And don't get me wrong, I'm still excited to read book three. I just can't believe how bored I was for most of this. It was just a whole lot of chat. Like we started off the book with Sophie and we're trying to find a meal and we do end up finding a meal. It turns out it's not actually all that special. And like, he's gone off to live with Bryce's parents. Okay, that's a nice little happy ever after. But that happened like halfway through, I guess, somewhere around there. But the stuff with Sophie doesn't really amount to a whole lot in this. And then we just have so many connections to Danica. And like, can we get over Danica, please? <laughs> like, it seems like every single road leads to Danica. So many secrets keep coming up. And then Bryce is like, that doesn't sound like Danica. I know Danica, she would never do that or she wouldn't, she wouldn't have been with you. What is it when like Baxian says, oh, me and Danica were like mates. It's like, Bryce was like, no, that's not, that's not true. And I'm just like, Bryce, girl, how many times has this happened so far? And we're only in the first two books of the series. It wouldn't surprise me if Danica turned out to be alive. And it turns out like she's been orchestrating the whole war and she's the bad guy. Like it just wouldn't surprise me at this point. I honestly do wish that we could just let Danica rest. I'm kind of sick of everything being tied back to her. Or that she did all of this stuff before she died that Bryce didn't know about. I'm just like, how close were they actually? Like the more we find out about Danica, the less I'm liking her. I thought she was so badass. And like, don't get me wrong, she does badass things. She found out so much, she's done so much. But at this point, I'm like, she hasn't been that good a friend to Bryce then. I mean, Gage, like she put a horn on freaking Bryce's back. She put a target on Bryce's back. She put her in danger without telling her anything about what she's just done to her. So yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at this point if she turns out to be the big bad at the end of this. So number one on my wish list for House of Flame and Shadow, less of Danica. Hunt and Bryce, uh, again, I'm just gonna sound like such a hater, but I don't really like them as a couple. I've, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Hunt has become whipped. Like Hunt is supposed to be the Umbra Mortis. He's supposed to be this really formidable person. And like, you know, it, it just doesn't come across that way whatsoever. Every single time he is with Bryce, he's thinking about fucking Bryce. And when he's not with Bryce, he's thinking about fucking Bryce. He's whipped. In the amount of times his balls tightened. What is it fucking cold in there? Turn the heating on. Literally, Bryce took a breath, Hunt's balls tightened. Bryce shoved her finger in her belly button and did a little bit of this and pulled out a string of belly button fluff. Hunt's balls tightened. I'm just sick of it. And then, in fact, actually, Rune's balls kept tightening as well. Look, that's not normal ball behavior. They need to get checked. But the sex scenes, honestly, between Hunt and Bryce, I wanted to skip them. And I've never said that before about any kind of sex scene. I wanted to skip them. I just found them so cringy. I just did not want them to. And I think because this book lacked a cohesive plot, it was like, okay, we're sacrificing plot for this. And the romance is moving way too quickly. The fact that Hunt was face deep in clunge when Bryce said, I love you for the first time. I didn't like it. I didn't like, it's too quick, it's too soon. I'm not liking them as a couple. I'm, I'm not. like. There was a little bit of sexual tension in the first book, yes. But then as soon as we get into this one and they get into like normal couple behavior, I'm like, all that tension just fizzled out. And I believe that's probably why Sarah Chana didn't want them to fully go at it until the solstice because she wanted to keep that sexual tension, but it's gone. It's gone, girl. There is no sexual tension whatsoever. In fact, every single time it looks like they're about to do it, I roll my goddamn eyes. I'm like, oh, please, no, not again. Where is Hunt's personality outside of Bryce? Please show me and show me the receipts because I'm not going to take it at face value. And the whole stuff with Ethan and trying to connect with Connor in the Bone Quarter and all of that stuff, I didn't care whatsoever. I couldn't care for it. Rune and his like mindling sex with Daylight. I was just like, we're having mind sex now? Like what is going on? Can we just get to the plot? It's honestly so weird me saying that though, because nine times out of 10, I'm usually all in on the the filth. Not today, not today. The conflict between Juniper and Bryce too, the fact that Bryce was using like her princess privileges. And again, like this is just making Bryce sound even less likable to me because she's just perfect. She's just everything. Absolutely everything. She can open the rift. She's got the horn. She's half fair. 
she can teleport. But yeah, the, that Jennifer and Bryce conflict, uh, it's about a fucking dance school. I, I don't know if I'm connected with any character anymore. I, I still like Fury because we're only getting little bits of Fury. But as soon as we get any more screen time or page time of a character, I go off them. I do. I don't know, I don't know what to say anymore. The amount of times that Sarah J Maas goes the male and the female, especially in regards to when like someone's speaking, I just, I found that so annoying. It was hard enough as well when we have like a growing cast of characters to know exactly who is speaking at certain times or who is doing what in a certain scene and then we get the male, the female. I'm just like, can you just say their fucking names? And I think the only reason right now why I'm kind of liking the ending a little bit is because it went from being boring to something actually happening. And I guess the bar is pretty low on that. I've got to take what I can take. I guess as well, the stakes just aren't really here. Whenever it seems like someone's gonna die, it just doesn't happen. There was a moment where Ethan gets his like throat ripped out by some demons and he just heals and it's all fine because like when people have made the drop and stuff, they are literally pretty much immortal unless they are like really badly grievously wounded. And that's why I thought with Ethan because it said, oh, his lifeless body and stuff like that. So I was like, oh, perfect. We've had a death. That makes things a bit more exciting. But no, pretty much everyone important survives. Cormac does die, but like he wasn't someone I was ever connected to anyway. And it really does take a lot of the tension out of a story when you just know every single person is protected by plot armor and Sarah J Mass just won't kill them off. I feel like the only time I've had a shock and death in the series was Danica in the first 60 pages of the first book, but I'm sick of her now. Like seriously, I'm sick of her. It almost feels like she didn't die because of how often she is brought up and how often she is connected to what semblance of a plot we have. What I'm excited for in book three is that Hunt and Bryce are most likely gonna be separated now because I have no idea when Bryce will be able to go back to Midgard. She is in a, a predicament. So that makes me excited because I just don't wanna read another book where they're just constantly horny for each other. Although saying that, saying that, I bet you most of the book, the next book will be Bryce pining after Hunt and Hunt pining after Bryce. And yeah, I guess they're in love. They've said, I love you to one another now. I haven't felt that natural progression get there or anything, but they've said I love you. So yeah, of course they're gonna miss one another, but I just need some individuality from them. And for Hunt to actually live up to the Umbra Mortis name and not just be this whipped guy who just, he comes across as such a teenager. I want a man, start acting like a man. And it would be so nice as well if you could stop pairing as well. So I'm gonna give House of Sky and Breath two stars. I think two stars is fitting. It's not the worst thing I've ever read, but it definitely was one of the most boring that I've read so far this year. And a big disappointment too, to follow up from the first book. Can you give me that? Please. Did anyone know that when you search House of Flame and Shadow on Google, it does this? <sighs> Pretty. Oh my God. What is that? Okay, you sexy bitches. And yes, I'm talking about you. I'm partway through House of Flame and Shadow. I'm on page 239. And I haven't quite finished part one yet. I was reading this really late last night and decided I wanted to go to bed. <laughs> like the old man I am. Gone are the days when I could stay up until five in the morning binging an entire book. So first impressions of this. I'm liking this more than the second book already. I feel like there is way more intrigue and it feels like it has a genuine plot that we're kind of working with right now. And I'm just so invested in what the characters are doing and how they're gonna get out of the situations that they're in. So the fact that Bryce is pretty much with Nesta and Asriel for the majority of the first part of this actually made me quite happy. Like, I'm not too sure how I feel about the whole multiverse thing, but having Bryce interact with Nesta and having these moments in this kind of like cave-like structure where they're going through this, they've been caved in, which actually turns out why is that book upside down? Which actually turned out to be orchestrated by Asriel and Nesta was in on it just to get more of a vibe from Bryson to see exactly who she is and what kind of threat she 
presents to the world. So I really love those scenes in the caves. It's when Celine is talking about her story, which I don't know why, but it gave me kind of God of War vibes. You know, the video game, God of War Ragnarok, it gave me those kinds of vibes. It's the Asteri, but like, what was the old name of them? I've forgotten and I, I have it highlighted somewhere but I don't tab so it's kind of hard to find again. Anyway, look, you've probably read this book so I already know. Um, so it was really interesting to find out the history of them and how they sort of got to Midgard. Like that was all very interesting. And you know what, this whole sequence of Nessa and Bryce and even Asriel for the majority of part one, it had atmosphere which is something that I think the second book sorely lacked. The second book had zero atmosphere. It was really hard to feel immersed in that very dialogue heavy, question asking circle of hell <laughs> it was reading that book. But this one, it feels a lot more, I don't know, like it, it just already feels better. And I do like the fact that Bryce is split up from Hunt. Like I'm honestly rooting for them to be split up more often. In Hunt, Rune and Danica's mate, I keep wanting to call him Baxton, but I know that's wrong. Brax, Braxton, Tony Braxton. Oh, Daglan, that's what the oldest area were called. Daglan. And Bryce is trying to find out how to uh, defeat them, which honestly is so interesting. I love, I kind of love that plot. But what the, what's the other freaking guy's name? I, what I need to do is do a character list, I think. Baxian. Baxian, that's it. So Baxian, Rune, and Hunt are currently like being tortured, and Rigilus is orchestrating that whole thing. And Lydia, who is day, Agent Daybreak, Daylight, whatever, she is trying to get help to get Rune and Hunt and I've already forgotten his name. Like seriously, his name is not sticking in my brain. B, I'm gonna call him B. She's trying to get them free, trying to get them to escape. And so she has enlisted the help of Tharian, Declan, Mark, and honestly I love the fact that Declan and Mark are like boyfriends, like that's just so cute. And all of that again I find so intriguing, like honestly the plot is really good in this one so far. I don't want to get my hopes up too much because again I'm only like 250 pages in out of 800 and something, so there is time for it to go tits up. I will say as well though, I really don't like Hunt. I really don't. Who is Hunt away from Bryce? I love the fact that Bryce is able to be her own character away from Hunt. Bryce's stuff with uh, Nesta, great. Honestly, great. Like, she's able to have conversations. She's able to have her own personality. And she actually kind of is more likable without her pining over Hunt every two pages. And she's mentioned Hunt a couple of times, but like, not overwhelmingly. But every single time we go to Hunt, he is constantly talking about Bryce or thinking about Bryce every single time. And I know he can't do much because he is getting like tortured and shit, but like who is Hunt away from Bryce? Who is he? If you can't actually answer that question, then I'm sorry to say that he's a terrible character. Like I feel like that's like such an unpopular opinion, so I really do apologize. And like I do find him attractive, he is hot, whatever. But honestly Hunt, go five seconds without mentioning Bryce challenge. Every single time he mentions her, I'm actually getting so fed up. I'm even writing on this as well, like, oh my god, stop, please. <laughs> Hunt shut out the sounds and smells. Bryce and his future and those beautiful kids, that was the image he held in his mind instead. Like, I understand, again, that like, he can't do much, but I'm telling you, even if he wasn't in this cell, if he wasn't actually being tortured and, and stuff, he would still be non-stop talking about Bryce every single time. I do like some of the moments with Rune and B. Especially when Rune makes like some kind of joke. Also, it's just like really nice not to have like a really cringy sex scene every like five pages. That just doesn't need to happen. Where's the joke? Like I, this was like one of the very few moments where I liked Hunt. But like Rune says, want to hear a joke? Two angels and a fae prince walk into a dungeon. And then they all just start laughing. Uh, Baxian, Rune, Hunt. And then um, Pollux comes in and he says, shut the fuck up, and then Hunt laugh louder. Like, I can understand, like, that would be so funny. I like when Hunt can connect with Rune and Baxian, and it feels almost like a little bit of a brotherhood kind of thing. So that's, like, really cool to see. But then he'll mention Bryce, and I'll roll my eyes. At this point, I don't need to know about it. Keep it in here, Hunt. I don't care. Tharian as well. I like his storyline as well. You know how he kind of gave himself over to the Viper Queen, and he's now seemingly addicted to her blood, or like the venom that she produces. Like it's like this really big high, so I wonder if maybe we'll explore some kind of addiction storyline for him. I like Ari as well, who he kind of puts heads with under the Viper Queen's rule, but now she's been moved somewhere else, so I don't know where she's gone to. Also, like as much as I, I'm finding it fine, the whole multiverse thing, and I am liking the Bryce and Esther scenes and stuff, what I don't love 
is the fact that when Sarah J Maas does have a sort of crossover kind of thing, it's the rimming of the previous characters that really puts me off because it feels like fan fiction. Like Bryce, literally, she takes one look at Nesta and she's like, she's a warrior. And I'm just like, have you read the Court of Thorns and Roses books? Is that why you think that? Like, you can't just tell that from just looking at her. Like, she's like, oh, those eyes, those eyes. I'm just like, and Reeson says one line, he says a line, and Bryce is like, he has such power. He must be the axis of this entire world. I'm just like, what is it about the current main character, mean previous main characters, and like, automatically thinking, like, they're incredible, and they're amazing, and they're you know what I mean? It's like, it's such a nitpicky thing for me, but that kind of interaction where it's like, that person's a warrior, she's a warrior. I'm just like, why would you think that from just looking at them? You know, like, I do like Nesta a lot, but you don't just get that from just looking at her. Like, I, I, and that's probably nitpicky, you probably could. I don't know, it just didn't feel natural. It felt very clunky, the way that they were interacting to begin with. I'm just, I didn't like it. I don't like rimming the characters from before. Like a lot of the inner monologue that Bryce has as she's going along with Nesta, it just doesn't feel natural, you know? I don't know, could just be a me thing. But I am liking this so far. Separation of Bryce and Hunt, perfect. And a lot more of an interesting plot line. And who knows, maybe Hunt will get more interesting now because is it Rigilus has taken some of the lightning from Hunt. And it seems like Hunt has to choose which one dies, Baxian or Rune. And I'm like, okay, give Hunt a good storyline. Give him a storyline. Give him something to do and think of outside of Bryce, please. Show me he is a genuine, fully fleshed character. Please, that's all I'm asking for. Not just a love interest, but something more than a love interest. Okay, I'm currently doing some reading sprints with my patrons so that I can knock out House of Flame and Shadow. I'm currently on page 599. I am so close, but uh, I did finish part two. And like, I'm... This book's like giving me a little bit of a headache. I feel like I preferred part one over part two. I feel like part one had a lot more adventure elements to it. It felt a little bit more exciting. Part two had a little bit more of, like, a lot of explanations for things, like, and how things work. You know, just a lot of things that I didn't find as interesting as the first part. Some interesting things do happen, and revelations, like, the fact that Hunt has two gay dads. I mean, not really. But he was kind of, like, lab-made, in a way, to be a weapon. And that gave Hunt a little bit more to work with. Like, if this ever gets adapted in the future, and the actor of Hunt has to act out all of these scenes. I feel like this could be something that the actor can really chew in on. Because even up to this point, just not a whole lot to say about Hunt in general. I was hoping that Bryce and Hunt would be separated for a lot longer. However, they do reunite. Hunt and Rune and Braxian do end up escaping with the help of Lydia. Okay, one thing I do hate though, like I, and it was so good at the time too, the fact that Lydia, she dies, right? And I was like, oh, finally, we have some stakes. Yeah, at the end of chapter 35, Lydia let out a choked bloody laugh as she died, right? That's how the chapter ended. I was like, oh my, oh my. Like, we actually have some kind of stakes here. Like, something exciting is really happening. And like, the characters actually feel like they're in danger. What? But then just a few pages later, like 15 pages later, she had a functioning heart again. If the monitor marking every heartbeat was any indication, because Lydia had died. When Therian had carried her back from the core, she'd been completely dead. Even her veneer healing abilities had been overtaxed. And yet she still manages to survive. I'm like, but the end of the chapter said that she died. Like, that's a lie. <laughs> Is it too much to ask for people to die? It's feeling like too lovey-dovey right now. The characters are like, support one another so much and like they're so proud of one another and they're like she's a fucking queen yes queen why does this feel so safe this is what it's feeling like to me it feels so safe don't get me wrong i'm still really intrigued by the plot like we're working against the asteri they need to take on six asteri bryce uh she has two bits of star power <laughs> right thea did some weird shit with the star magic right Okay, Bryce has two of those pieces, but Helena used Avalon's nexus of ley lines and natural magic to hide the third piece. So Bryce needs to get the third piece of star magic. So I'm, just, I'm trying to take it seriously. 
And if she can get that piece, the sword and knife will be able to open a portal to nowhere and we can trap the Asteria inside. Like, that's kind of the goal. So the genuine goal really, like, overall is to take down the Asteria, which is great. Like, I love that goal. It's going to be so hard to do. And I'm excited for that. Like, I am excited for the overall plot, the overall plot. It's going to be good. I can feel it. I can feel it in my waters. I can feel it in my house of many waters. But... Everything else, I'm really not liking. I don't love the fact that Lydia survived. I'm really just wanting true danger. Like, I want to feel scared for the characters. I don't feel scared for them. I know they're going to win. I know it in my heart. And that most likely there's going to be no casualties. Although one, I did love one scene with the necromancy. Yeah, when Ethan had, you know, he obviously killed Sigrid. And Hypaxia is bringing her back to life, essentially. She'd sewed Sigrid's head back on, like, that's disgusting. But I love the whole scenes of her sort of coming back to life, like, her, the stitches popping, her, Sigrid slowly turned her head, but her chest, it didn't rise and fall, she wasn't breathing. And she's now a half life, a walking corpse, and just like, all of that stuff was so good, like, I love the visuals, don't get me wrong. But I'm just not loving the characters this time round. I'm really finding it so hard to connect. Like, Bryce has another name to her name. Like, she can world walk. She's a world walker. Like, fucking hell, what, what next? Don't even get me started on her power. All she has to do is light the room up. This is Bryce whenever she uses her magic. An iPhone 12 could do the same thing. And I'm just not really finding, like, the magic interesting anymore. I'm really not, which is a shame because, I, again, I'm not being a hater. I'm not being a hater. And speaking of Lydia, her and Rune, you want to think I don't like love, but I do. I love love. Love is love. But why is it every single time a male gets any kind of whiff of a female in this, their balls tighten or their cock twitches? It's like, can these guys just have a nice romantic moment without it becoming sexual? And again, I'm the last person who ever says something like this. I love me some sexual freedom. I love heat in spiciness. But I honestly wish to God that we would stop having half sex scenes or like near sex scenes or whatever is in this. I, I, I just wanted to stop. Like can Rune not have a conversation with Lydia without him getting an erection? It's honestly kind of gross. It's kind of gross. Sarah J Mass is making it seem like every single time a guy interacts with a girl, it gets hard. It's the same with Hunt. I know every single person in this is gonna be absolutely gorgeous and godlike and goddess-like, and they're the best things you've ever seen in your life. But come on, every time. Can we not have one conversation without some kind of movement in the groin area? So honestly, I'm just focusing on plot right now and plot alone. I don't even think I have a favorite character anymore, <laughs> which is such a shame. I miss Fury. I want Fury. I think I've already got like just over 200 pages left. I'm sure as we gear up for this battle against the Asteri, that it will be more plot heavy than character driven. And we're gonna have like less less of this and more of this. But it's still better than House of Sky and Breath. Cause at least I'm not bored. Like I'm not bored, which is great. But at the same time, I was kind of hoping I'd have fallen head over heels in love with this by this point. But the characters are putting me off. I haven't quite finished yet. I have about 90 pages. Can you love and hate something at the same time? Because that feels like me right now. Like I'm loving the action that's happening right now. I'm loving where the plot's going. I love how it's making me feel. Like it's not great by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm having such a good time right now. And don't get me wrong, there are moments where I'm like, I really hate this, like I do not want this. And there are other moments where I'm like, Oh, but I kind of love this, you know, I, I want to like read more of this and I want the next book right now and stuff like that. So I am on page 742. Oh my gosh, I don't even know what the hell's just happened. Rune has just shot Lydia. <sighs> He's saying I can't let you get yourself killed. And she says, I will never forgive you for this. I know Rune said and fired one shot right to her thigh. Like to stop her because like she's trying to find her kids. But obviously that's going to be putting herself in danger and Rune's like, no. So that's really extreme. Like, he's just shot her. But now... I will never forgive you for this, never, I know. Like, is that it then? Is it over between them? I kind of hope so. I'm not gonna lie, I don't root for anyone. <laughs> I don't root for any of the romantic relationships. We had this really random sex scene between Bryce and Hunt, 
and then Rune and Lydia almost back to back in I just I, I don't want it. I just don't want it. And it's like in every sex scene as well, Sarah J Maas says her entrance or says something like met him stroke for stroke and things like that. You know, it's just such repetition that I don't know if it's my ADHD or if it's just annoying me just in general, but like how constantly repetitious the sex scenes are. I just don't want them anymore. I really don't. In fact, I would find them a lot more tolerable as a couple, Bryce and Hunt and Lydia and Rune, if we didn't have them just randomly being like, I want you, I want you inside of me. In the middle of talking about a war or in the middle of talking about hundreds of people dying, you know, Lydia could be like, oh, you know, my kids are in danger and Regulus might kill them. Let's have sex. That's literally how it comes across as. In Bryce and Hunt, I just, I don't vibe with them. I really don't. However, however, Hunt has his Umbra Mortis suit. He has that. He's gonna look badass. You know, he has his two swords. Like now we're gonna see Hunt actually do so many cool things. Now that we have so much happening in terms of the battles that are going on, the hysteria that are getting, well, not exactly brought down just yet, but Bryce and everyone have released this video of the truth, you know, the truth. The hysteria have uh, infected the water. They're infected with some kind of parasite and they're taking power from people. They don't need to, they don't need this power. They don't need to be in charge. Like their power is a sham. They need you more than you need them in a sense, you know? Like, that's kind of how it's coming down to. So I'm really loving the plot. Like, I'm loving the plot right now. There's, I mean, obviously it can be better and stuff, but like, it's fun and it's entertaining, so I'm loving that side of it. But I, it's the characters. I, I don't really think I like the characters anymore. There's too much ass kiss in between them. And like, pretty much every single page I have to hear about how amazing each of them are. And it just makes me resent them. And I don't, I know that's probably really weird to say, but like, I'm sick of hearing how great and powerful and amazing and perfect they are. Like, it's just, I, I can't relate to them. They're losing their relatability every single book. Bryce was so relatable at the start of House of Earth and Blood by House of Flame and Shadow. She has all of these accolades. She's the best person in the world, the most powerful. Only she can take down everyone. You know what I mean? It's just like, I've had enough. <laughs> I will say as well, I liked how Nesta was brought into it again by giving Bryce the mask. That was really exciting. I like that. Oh yeah, in the uh, video and stuff with Hunt and Bryce telling everyone today we can't tell you that it's worth it fighting back, that it's possible to defy them and live, that their hierarchies, their rules, it's all bullshit and it's time to put a stop to it. It feels very Mockingjay. It feels very Hunger Games Mockingjay, but we're really like building up to something. Oh, it actually as well, the scene between Connor and Ethan and Connor saying all of our second light from every soul here, it's yours to put in that bullet, use it well. Because now there's like a God Slayer rifle that, um, like this bullet thing that Connor gives to Ethan that Bryce now needs, obviously. But like, it's so sad. Ethan's door constricted, but if you, if you turn into second light, I'm already gone, Ethan. That's kind of sad. And again, like, I don't love the characters, but I can tell when there's a sad moment. <laughs> I'm not that heartless. Oh my god, I was totally gagged when the Under King exploded into Sparkling Shards of Ice. Literally. <gasps> when Sabine, oh my god, when Ethan kills Sabine, wigless. Absolutely wigless. That was so cool. And now he's the Prime. <gasps> and the Autumn King. How could I forget as well? Rune killing the Autumn King. Rune who had driven the sword right through their father's cold heart. Like, they killed his father. Wigless. Wickless! <laughs> this is one of the times when I agree with Hunt. When, uh, obviously, like, Bryce is a, a world walker. And then when Hunt says, add it to Bryce's list of magical starborn princess crap. Like, literally. Literally. Anyway, it's really exciting again. Very excited to read the last 90-ish pages. Finish the book. What time is it now? It's like 11pm now, so I probably won't finish it until around about midnight. Just after midnight. <sighs> Here we go. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay, okay. Um, 
I finished. I finished. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the positives. Now, the negatives, it was a bit of a messy, messy ending. And is this it? Is there not going to be another Crescent City book after this? Things wrapped up. But I, I feel like we will be getting more. Like, what about House of Many Waters? Like, are we not getting that? I, I hmm. So I'm so conflicted. <laughs> I'm so conflicted. I, I was so excited for this confrontation with the Asteri and, you know, Bryce taking them down. But all that, like, conflict, the, the fight, all that really was, was uh, Bryce throwing her power at the floor, getting the gun thing of Ethan, shooting the floor, making a black hole, the hysteria getting sucked in, Bryce getting sucked in, going into deep space, <laughs> Hunt coming in and getting Bryce out of there, Bryce dying but not actually dying, like we knew she wasn't dead. Like, come on, Hunt, what was with the theatrics? She obviously wasn't dead. I mean, she was dead. Like, she literally did die. But, like, she wasn't staying dead. We knew this. We knew this. She was going to die. Nobody died. Literally. This is what I said. This was one of my big problems with this book so far. And I think with the previous book, too. There was just no mistakes. And when you have a series like Crescent City, where literally in the first 60 pages of book one... Somebody who you think is a really important character and does turn out to still be an important character dies within 60 pages, gets killed. It's like you're kind of expecting a certain quality from this series, but then nobody important really dies after that. Like None of the good guys die after that, really. We have what is supposed to be this war that's like 15,000 years in the making or, you know, like the Asteri have this really rich history and yet, and yet, there just wasn't any casualty. There wasn't any tension with taking them down, you know? It let me down. It did. It let me down. It, it happened way too quickly. And what was the point of the whole, like, dagger in the horn thing? Like, nothing really came out of that. It felt like we were building up to a little bit more than what we actually got. It's like, Sarah Janet got to a certain point in this book, and then her agent called and said, look, we need this tomorrow. I do have this thing where I really enjoy how addictive the writing style is, but like, I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't, it, it was very hard to. I think this is a problem I have with this series. Like, and I did love the Akatar series and I didn't really read the Throne of Class series, but like this one, it felt like the emotions, I was being told what to feel. I was being told what I should think about characters. So like, if a character's feeling a certain emotion, it's told in a way like, oh, it was pure joy and love. It was pure joy and hope. You know, things like that were told so directly to me that it made me go back and it made me like kind of resent what was being told to me. Almost like, you know, when you don't like being told what to do. <laughs> it's like, I don't want you to tell me I should be feeling hope and joy and love right now. I want to feel it. Show me how to feel that. And the same with characters. Like, they tell you the emotions. They tell you what you should be feeling. And I have this need where I'm like, no, don't tell me what to feel. I don't feel that. I don't feel the love and the hope and the joy and what have you. And I'm not a big whole fan of, like, the way that magic was depicted in this by the end of it, really. Like, for instance, Lydia had known, even as a child, that she was pure power, and she'd kept that power buried in her veins. So the amount of times that we are told that characters have power, or just, like, light, and I'm like, okay, but what does that mean? What does that mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? I honestly feel like it means less every single time. It's just said, oh, they had power. They threw their power they had power and, you know, it just, this could never be adapted. Because all it would be is, well, one, you wouldn't be able to see the fucking screen. Because Bryce would be like a fucking headlight. It would literally be Crescent City, directed by J.J. Abrams. You won't be able to see anything. People will just be throwing light and, and power, whatever power means. You know, it's like, what, what is power? Define that for me. So I found like the whole magic and power system, like the amount of corniness as well. 
It was love that was holding the portal open, that held it open until the very end, until Hunt and Bryce were through, crashing into the dirt of Midgard, the blue sky filling his sight and all that beautiful air filling his lungs. You know, it's like, it's so corny. The ending is so corny. And then, yeah, Bryce is dead. No, she isn't. I literally wrote here, no, she isn't. Hun looked down at his mate, so still and cold and lifeless. That scream that came out of him shook the very world. Like, but we know she's not dead. Like, I was sitting reading this, like, she'll be alive in two pages. So it's Jessica. Jessica says, after 15,000 years, I've had my fill of Midgard. You caused me to a immortality, now I'm making it a gift. The gift of a Vignette's long life. I give it freely to Bryce Quinlan if she wants it. Napoleon snapped, that curse is for the living. And she says that it is a good thing I have a way with the dead. Like, it's just bullshit. It's bullshit. Well, Hypaxia says that last bit. But like, it's just bullshit. Like, come on. Bryce dies. So, Jessica goes into this afterlife kind of world thing where Bryce is. And over the hill... There is seven figures. At first I was like, oh shit, is it Snow White the Seven Fucking Dwarfs? Because seriously, how more cornier can we get? Because it turns out to be fucking Danica, Connor, like the pack of devils. Oh, it was so corny. So much of it's corny. This is why I don't love the romance, I think, being depicted in the series. I just find Bryce and Hunt corny as fuck. I find Lydia in Rune corny as fuck. Although I will say with Lydia, I love the depiction of motherhood. You know when she says goodbye to her sons making sure that they're safe? Her boy Stefan say that too. Perhaps finally understanding what, who their mother was, what it guided her all these years, and will continue to guide her in her final moments. Like it is so nice to see that depiction of motherhood. I do think Lydia as a character alone is probably one of the best characters in this. Like where was Fury? I really wanted Fury and she didn't even appear. One thing I will say as well, that again, this review is gonna be all over the place because I'm just like, I'm still in my feelings. Like, what am I thinking right now? I don't know, I'm a mess. But what I'm really glad we didn't get was because even though we have this whole Akatar crossover thing, we did not get that Avengers moment. I genuinely thought we would end up getting to this point where there would be this big battle and all of the Akatar cast, all of the Crescent City cast will be running onto the battlefield, fighting together, and that would be the Avengers moment. I'm so glad we did not get that. I would have been so pissed off if we did, honestly. And I thought we were heading that way. So that's one way that this book actually surprised me. Also interesting as well, when Bryce returns the mask, she also gives Nesta the Star Sword. The age of the Starborn is over on Midgard, it ends with me. I think that a pointed star was tattooed on you for a reason. Take that sword and go figure out why. So I'm like, is this going to be explored in Akatar 5? Like, when's that coming? What's next? You know, what's next from Sarah Jana? Because you know, I'm going to buy it anyway. <laughs> Whatever it is, I'm going to get it. Even if I did find this a bit of all over the place, a little bit messy. Bryce ends the royal houses. The fame monarchy is abolished. Like, good. Like, I'm glad all of that happened. I don't know. I guess I was just expecting more from the ending. It didn't feel as epic as we were building to. I need to sit on this a little bit more, I think. But I'm going to give this one three stars. Because I do think it was better than House of Sky Breath. And I know I've just been sat here complaining this entire time. I do think, though, that this one kept my interest a lot more. I thought the first part was pretty damn entertaining. Third part, while messy, pretty entertaining for the most part. Second part was a little bit dull to me, but still better than House of Sky and Breath, I think. So all three books have been read, and I do still think that the first book, House of Earth and Blood, is the best book. I think it was the least convoluted and the most fun to read, I think. It was before characters got really annoying, love interests lost all personality, and just became obsessed with their love interests, you know, like... Yeah, I think the first book's my favourite, followed by House of Fame and Shadow, and then House of Sky and Breath is my least favourite. Four star, two star, three star. That's how the series has gone for me. And I feel pretty happy with that rating. That feels right to me right now. Give me more time with House of Fame and Shadow, though. That could go down to a 2.5, maybe. I don't know. But at the minute, it's a three. Also, I want to end this vlog by saying the first two books have this really nice matte feel to the dust jackets, whereas House of Fame and Shadow has this 
cheaper feel to it. It doesn't feel as nice. So I don't know why that is, but I just wanted to end this vlog on that note. So thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to leave this video a like if you enjoyed and subscribe if you haven't already. Leave all your comments down below. Let me know what you thought of the vlog. Let me know what you thought of the books. What did you think of House of Flame and Shadow? Please tell me everything. I haven't had a chance to talk to anyone about it yet. So please let me know in the comments down below. I want to give a huge thank you to my patrons and my One Piece channel members for supporting my channel. If you'd like to join my Patreon or my One Piece channel membership, then all the links are down in the description box. But yeah, I hope I will see you in the next video. Bye.